go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to uh, the first meeting of the Travel, Recreation, Wildlife and Cultural Resources uh, Standing Committee. Um, I would just like to introduce our new secretary, uh, Doreen cash -Glotzer. She's new and we're excited to have her. And of course, Emily from LSO is here to help us with the uh, Zoom. Uh, we only have uh, one new uh, senator here and uh, Senator Jones from Rock Springs. We're excited to have her. I think you know the rest of the, the players up here. So anyway, welcome. And uh, since I'm new, I've got my right hand gal here who's going to help me out, uh, Vice Chairman Ellis. We just kind of switched chairs this year. And um, so hopefully she'll keep me lined out and, and we'll, get, we'll get things done that we need to get done. So uh, someone asked me earlier how I wanted to be uh, addressed. I don't care if you say chairwoman or Madam Chair or Madam Chairman or really as long as you don't say, hey, you, I think we'll be OK. So just yeah, send the comments to the chair and, and I think we'll be OK. Um, other than that, I think uh, make sure your cell phones are turned off and, and we'll go ahead and get started. So um, first of all, we're going to start with Senate File 58, Sutton Archaeological Site Administration. And I know we have uh, Director Westby and Deputy Director Glenn here today to kick us off. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman Committee. Good to see you. Um, few new faces on this committee, some returning faces. Nice to see you guys. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of this uh, uh, Senate File 58. Um, as most of you are aware, we, we addressed this during the interim study, and it was some great discussions. I think there's uh, some tours as well that uh, had, had been had, but just a little bit of history um, for you all on the property itself. Um, it's 46 acres uh, just northeast of Guernsey State Park, um, just uh, near the former town of Sunrise. Uh, we had a, what's called a site criteria process in statute, um, and many of you may have remembered, state parks and historic sites uh, there for a decade or so ago were becoming the dumping grounds of anybody that wanted to eliminate uh, stuff out of their own uh, wheelhouse and put it into the state to take care of and the albatrosses that could go with all that. And so the legislature at that time put forward what's called the site criteria process, which forced our hands to take uh, an active role in doing due diligence and studying the facility, doing finding out what do we want it to look like uh, if it does become a state park or a state historic site. We bring in stakeholders, not only locally, but others that might be of interest. Like this time we brought in the Native American, uh, the tribe, so we could get their take on it as well. But during our studies on it, it, it really became evident that there was some looting going on. Uh, it was on private land. And through the due diligence, um, we, we basically came up with some options. One, we could develop it into a, a significant historic site or archeological site, bring in tour buses and do just like a normal state historic site would be. Uh, from that gamut all the way to just put up a fence and secure it for future generations and studies to ensure that the looting starts to become much less. And that's where this body during the interim study landed on was we want it to be preserved for uh, the test time. We want you to secure it and uh, not necessarily operate it, but just make sure that uh, there's it, it, it will be there for future generations to study. Uh, in, in, in doing so, we had the state archaeologist, state archaeological, state archaeologist, sorry, he's only in my agency, I should know how to say his name. Um, <laughs> Spencer Pelton, uh, he was actively involved in the study as well, the due diligence portion of it. And a lot of the conversation kind of landed on this could be a World Heritage Site. So this is a, a site that uh, could definitely become uh, significant enough because of the nature of the history uh, of, of the site and what it, how it pertained to the Native Americans uh, in, in, in this whole North American continent. And so. Um, I'm kind of bouncing and I apologize, Madam Chairman, but the site criteria process was completed in November of uh, 2021. 
And like I said, uh, the committee recommended acceptance and I approved it uh, with the advice of the State Parks and Cultural Resource Commission. Um, Representative Haroldson was an active member on this due diligence stakeholder um, process as well. And uh, luckily it passed out of this uh, TRW interim um, unanimously uh, in August of 22 and why we're here today. Uh, just looking at some more of my notes, um, Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone, and all the signatory tribes uh, from Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 were also uh, solicited input as well. And so what this bill does, Madam uh, Chairman, Chairwoman, is uh, it basically designates the Sutton Archaeological Site as an archaeological site within the, our, in our purview. Uh, it has um, Section 36 1501 page one of the bill uh, is an existing uh, statute, but we added paragraph III uh, to basically designate this site. Um, and by rule, we'll have to actually make it the legal description right now. What's in the bill is just real generalistic. So we have two other archaeological sites. Um, I is Legend Rock, which is right outside of um, Hot Springs State Park and II in this bill. If you're wondering what the other two uh, before the triple I uh, is Medicine Lodge State Archaeological Site. And so this would be our third archaeological site in this. I think we're missing a page. I probably have the other page somewhere. Let me look. Do you have any copies? Okay. You said this is going to have on the back. Oh, you got the front page, not the. Yep. Not the meat and potatoes of it. I have it too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, page two. You want to look at it before I pass so I can understand the confusion of what me describing what the three eyes are if you don't have what the the last eye, eye, eye is. But uh, while you're getting that, I can talk a little bit more about the site. And um, Deputy Director Glenn can help, but I have uh, Carly Ann Carruthers, who is our uh, planning manager. She was actively involved in the whole due diligence process and any significant questions about the site. Uh, she's very uh, educated on the site and could could speak on behalf of any questions that you have particulars on that. But this is uh, just want to be really clear. This is not the red ochre mine. It's right next to it. What's on this site are the big rings where they did a lot of the ceremonial, uh, the ceremonial um, circles and everything that they did within adjacent to the mine, I'm assuming they would do the mining and then have the ceremonial pieces next to it. And that's what this site is. And the site was donated uh, by Mr. Sutton, who passed in, in his will, uh, wanted to ensure that it be preserved and protected because they were aware of the looting, but didn't have the means to try to keep an eye on it. And so in his passing, he put in a will that he'd like it to go to the state. And we talked with state lands, we talked, they talked with us about where it be the best possibility and obviously it landed with us through the due diligence piece and I, with that i'd stand for any questions i know you still don't have the second page of the bill but it's all right i think i think it's uh i think we're okay senator baldwin did you need to see it sure. yeah right. any questions madam co chair yes madam co chair as we get ready to have this um just baited on the floor i'm guessing this will advance today um in the budget note, it says the department indicated they have a suffi sufficient dollars um, to pay for this. We'll get asked how. Can you elaborate? <laughs> sure. Madam Chairwoman, um, Vice Chair Ellis, we have uh, in uh, Azure where we collect fees on uh, all of our state parks and historic sites. 
those fees go into the state park account and can be used for capital construction uh, interpretation, those types of things. And so what internally, the, the amount of costs, and I can't remember, remember how much the dollars were, it was maybe five to $10,000 worth of fencing that would be going on out there. And we felt rather than go after a, a, some funding for that, we would just try to absorb that within our existing capital construction uh, list. Other questions? Actually, I have one for you, uh, Director. And actually, maybe Carly can answer this as well. I'm not sure. Um, if this were to be designated as a World uh, Heritage Site, uh, where do we go from here? How does that look? Introduce yourself. I forgot to do that. <laughs> yes. Did I say it right, Carly? You did. OK. Um, I'm Carly Ann Carruthers. I'm the Planning and Grants Manager with State Parks, Historic Sites, and Trails. Um, and that is a great question of where we would go if it were to be a World Heritage Site. That's big news. <laughs> so I think there would be a lot of research and outlining before we got to that step. That wouldn't be you know, the next day after this becomes a state historic site by any means. Um, but we're really lucky to have a ton of talent within the agency and also on our State Parks and Cultural Resources Commission. I think Dr. Dudley Gardner has been probably the chief proponent of that World Heritage Site idea. Um, so I know he would have our backs. Other questions? Ma Madam Chair, just a follow up. Who designates the World Heritage Site? Is that the Department of Interior, or how does that work? Um, chairwoman and co-chairwoman, I believe that is actually UNESCO, isn't it, as a World Heritage Site? Um, and there's, before we reach that level, we would also probably be looking at national register status and other things um, at that federal level. Um, the state historic site designation itself would be kind of our, our state point. starts with, yeah. I have one other question. Uh, probably for the director or deputy director, but um, do you have any ideas of anything besides just the fencing and the, and the surveillance for now that, or is this to get, you know, for now, is this gonna be like two years of just kind of checking to see, making sure no one's looting and that sort of thing, or do you have some other plans down the road for what you might like to do with it? Yeah, Chairwoman Schuler, thanks for the question. I, fencing, um, you know, the cameras, but some extensive interpretive signage as to why why this why it's important um, obviously outside the fence so people as they're driving by can see what it is uh, probably a significant piece on uh, you know not just the interpretation of why the site is important but why it's important not to loot why it's important not to damage the property why it's important for us to try to maintain this for future generations research and, and ceremonies with within the Native American tribes any other questions or comments? Committee? Mr. Madam Co Chair? Yes. Madam Co Chair, do, or, do you have um, pictures? <laughs> just have okay. No, I have all copies here. Pictures. I'm still trying to figure out in my mind where this is exactly. So. So, Madam Chairwoman, what was handed out was a packet that was handed out during the interim to really describe um, the site as well as possible. Uh, in there, there's a few pictures, an aerial photo, um, yeah, taken back in 2020 uh, by our GIS specialist, um, and then there's a kind of a GIS map that kind of shows the property as well. And I think in this packet, there's some um, just the features and the cultural values as well in here. And I do have some other talking points that I'd be willing to share with whoever's carrying it on the floor. I just have one other question for you, Director. Also, uh, you mentioned that uh, the site is next to the Red Ochre Mine. And my understanding, for some reason, that the mine was part of it. But is it not part of the 50 acres or 48 acres? Right. Madam Chairwoman, it, it is not part of the site. It is still on private, um, that the, the mine itself is still on private, and I'm not 100% sure it's still not an active mining site, not necessarily for the ochre, but the mining site itself for what they extract. Correct? That is correct, yes. Other questions from the committee? 
Okay, I guess we have no other questions. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and open it for testimony from anyone in the crowd. Would like to uh, thank you, Director and Deputy Director and Carly. Thank you, and I guess for the record, uh, you, you can never not quit learning, but uh, as Carly did, Carly Ann did, she introduced herself for the record, and I realized I had not. I'm Darren Westby, I'm the Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. Well, actually, I think you're well known, but thank you for the introduction anyway, and thanks to all of you. Any, uh, anyone in the room that would like to testify? Do we have anyone online that would like to testify on this? Okay, I guess public testimony is closed. We'll go ahead and uh, ask for an action on the, the bill. Move the bill by Senator Baldwin. Second. Second by Senator Ellis. Let's go ahead and work the bill. It's, it's short and sweet. Won't take us long, I don't think. Let's start with page one. Any issues with page one? Page two, the one that most of you don't have, <laughs> but you've seen. All right. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We don't have any amendments or anything. Uh, all those in favor of moving the bill forward? Oh, roll call, you're right. Thank you. Roll call, Doreen. Thank you, Chairman. I did a visual roll call. Um, roll call vote? Yes. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Ellis. Aye. Senator Garou. Excused. Senator Jones. Aye. And Chairman Schuler. Aye. Thank you so much. No worries. All the ones in the copy center were incorrect also. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. There's an extra. I have four ayes and one excused. Thank you. That bill passes. Thank you. All right, moving on to our second bill. Uh, Senate File 59, State Parks Account Agency Expenditure Authority. I think we'll probably have the same uh, folks up here today we just had. At least you got some exercise. Chairman, may I interrupt you a moment? Yes. Who would you like to present this on the floor? I, I would love to have Senator Ellis. Thank She's you. actually been there and has, uh, she actually has some, some really cool stuff that she's taken, not taken, was given <laughs> from the site. <laughs> not taken, <laughs> scratch that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, scratch that. Uh, but no, she knows quite a bit about it. She's actually been there. I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. <laughs> Woo! See, my first big boo boo. <laughs> okay, moving on with uh, Senate File 59. Director. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, again, Darren Westby, uh, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. Appreciate the opportunity to present uh, SF-59, the State Parks Account Agency Expenditure Authority. Uh, again, this is an interim topic that we brought forward. Uh, just for some history, um, back in 2014-ish, we started seeing some budget reductions. And at that point, uh, we made the decision to come to this body and start talking to them about do we want to take the hit on the budget reduction and close some historic sites and maybe some parts of the state parks or do we want to try to find a way to help ourselves through this and and stay impactful to our visitors and our in our communities in which we have our parks and sites in and so we asked this body if we could start to use some of the fees that we generate to compensate for that general fund budget reduction. And so at that point, we asked for 25% of our fees that we collect to go towards uh, maintenance uh, and not operation at this point, but just the maintenance that kept us limping along through that budget cut. And then the next budget cut in 2016, we came back to this body and said, all right, we want to do the same thing. Can we bump it up 5% and go to 30, up to 30% of those fees to help compensate for that general fund reduction? And it passed. And then in 2020, when we had our significant budget reduction, we came back and said, we need another 30%. So we asked for another 30%. So that got us up to 60% that we could use for our fees to compensate for those budget reduction in general funds. And so we also realized that we couldn't spend all those monies on maintenance. And so we asked for the definition of how we could spend those funds to include the, the name operations or the word operations in there. And that passed uh, in, in a third reading amendment. 
there was uh, one that was brought that came up that said, all right, that's great, but we want it sunsetted. And it sunsets right now, as it cur currently reads in the statute, it, it sunsets in June 30th of this year. And so we worked in the interim to really focus on, one, uh, do we want to eliminate the sunset or uh, do we want to extend the sunset into the next, um, at least to the end of the biennium and work towards uh, the next, work in the next interim to either extend it again or get it removed. And the discussion through the interim was, well, let's just remove it. And that's what you see in the bill right now. Um, with our fiscal conservative nature within state parks and historic sites, as well as cultural resources as well, uh, we've never reached that up to 60%. And I think the up to is really important. And it was really important to us through all the testimony for the many years that we've been asking for this, giving us the flexibility of working underneath that cap, as opposed to forcing us to spend 25, 30, 60% of those fees on maintenance and operation, giving us the ability to be frugal uh, to where we can stay underneath that cap. And every percentage piece or every dollar that we don't spend in maintenance and operations out of those fees gets to go back into capital construction and you know those maintenance operations that we use in interpretation and all that what we standard use those funds for and so we've been very frugal i don't think we've hit uh came close to 50 percent one year i think when we had some significant things happen but realistically we've stayed underneath the cap we we work hard because we also know the importance of putting the money on the ground for improvements and and trying to you know make sure that we're giving the consumer what they want what they're asking for and that's what those funds are for by offsetting uh, some of those funds or the, some of those fees towards operations and maintenance it's taken a, a dip out of the capital construction, but at the same time, we also came to this body and asked for an increase in fees. So we increased our fees. Uh, and then luckily, if there is a lucky side of the pandemic, we saw a tremendous amount of visitation uh, in the same time frame. And so our capital construction budget uh, has actually not really seen a significant hit because of the strategic planning of increasing our fees little bit of luck with uh, getting a significant bump in visitation our revenue streams are still staying strong on that side of the house so we haven't seen a significant hit in capital construction and we've been able to keep parks and sites open by some of these moves and pretty proud of the team for um, seeing what um, having the ability to help ourselves was very important to us and uh, definitely would love to have general fund back in the, in the, in our budget, but we also understand that we now get to so much eat what you kill uh, in our parks and sites, our local people. They understand that, you know, having more visitation means that I can ask for more spending money for hiring seasonals or uh, buying, you know, more toilet paper and picking up trash and all the utility stuff of things that just happen to go along with the state park or historic site. You know, a lot of the, the visitation numbers that we saw in 2019 was what, 4.4 4 million, a little over 4 million. 2020, we were at 5.8 million. So we saw a significant bump. Uh, we've dropped a little bit. I think we're leveling off right now at about 5 million visitors a year within our system. And so, trying to ensure that our mission, which is impact communities and enrich lives, and we're staying successful with our mission, uh, closing a site or closing a state, part of a state park or all of a state park, we'd be going anti-mission with it. And so the team works really hard to ensure that we uh, make sure that we keep the parks open, do what we can to uh, give them and provide them with the, all opportunities to be impactful to those communities. Questions from the committee? Comments? I just have one question, and this might be just uh, maybe to offer a little bit more uh, information for our, our new members. Um, you started to explain a little bit what operational costs were. Could you talk about all the things that operational costs could include? Thank you. So um, in a general state park uh, historic site, there's the general maintenance, which is real basic. You know, yes, we need paint for the walls. Yes, we need to 
replace carpet or do those types of things, we have to uh, pay our contracts for haul off the trash and to pump out the pit vault toilets, the lovely stuff that we get to do on a day to day basis. But the operational piece, which is important, is our fee program, the people that actually collect the money are uh, manning the fee booths, uh, greeting people as they come in, given the interpretive conversation. So we have interpretive programs that we can't hire those people with maintenance money, but we can with operational definition. And so uh, park rangers is another one. Uh, we can't use maintenance money to hire a park ranger seasonally. Um, and I, I should really talk in, in the <clears throat> legislation back when we got the initial 25%, the last sentence in that bill says, uh, no amount of shall be expended for additional full-time employees or increases in salaries or overtime pay for full-time employees. So anything that I talk about hiring rangers or interpreted people or fee program, they're all seasonal people. Uh, and I, I think that's a good distinction uh, and it was a good part of the bill to ensure that we're not growing full-time employees with, with these funds and we're using the money where it needs to be. But those are the types of operational pieces that we really focus probably a majority of these funds on is interpretation, fee program, and park rangers. Madam Chair, Senator Ellis. Refresh my memory, Director, um, on the law enforcement piece, because I think we all are aware of the statistic that Guernsey is like the third largest city, um, Glen or Glendo Glen State Park is the third largest city in Wyoming in peak summer weekends. Um, and so that has demands on your um, law enforcement needs. Was that part of this conversation? I just can't remember. Madam Chairwoman, Vice Chair Ellis, um, yes, thanks for remembering. Uh, on a normal uh, weekend, Glendo State Park is the third largest community in the state of Wyoming. We have close to 25, 30,000 people that will show up on a weekend. Uh, for the most part, we have two rangers that we can find uh, and had the ability to pay for. Uh, if you think of a, a town of 25 or 30,000 people with two cops, uh, there's a lot that could go wrong and the public safety and, and the land stewardship that goes along with it is significantly important. Not only that, but having the, the fee program, people manning the booths and ensuring fee compliance, uh, if, if we don't have that, we're losing money. And so they almost pay for themselves as well. But uh, to go back to your point, Senator Ellis, um, the ability to hire good park rangers, um, and I, I think we can all attest hiring people right now is a struggle to begin with having the funds to be able to hire the right people is immensely important. And not to say we like to overpay people, but we, we have the ability to hire the right people because of what we get to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, in the same token, these people are seeing people at their best probably at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, probably seeing those same people at their worst at midnight to two. And, and they see the gamut and it's, uh, if you don't think that they're real law enforcement people, they should take a tour with them and see what they get to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's pretty impressive uh, and uh, eye-opening. And so thank you for that question. Senator Mulder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question, being a newbie on the committee. Um, everybody's familiar with Glendo. How many state parks are there? Number one, the two-part question. How many state parks when was the last time we designated a new state park? Chairwoman, Chairwoman Schuler, uh, Senator Baldwin, thanks for putting me on the on the spot. I believe we have 12 <laughs> state parks or state recreation areas, and we have 28 uh, historic sites or archaeological sites. Right around 40 is, I think, what we talked about. Um, it might be 41 with the advent of Quebec one now, but uh, that was the numbers that we uh, Kind of keep in mind, I think the newest thing added to our agency was Quebec One. Uh, that's a historic site, not a state park. Uh, the newest state park, that's a long time ago, and I can't quite tell you exactly which one it is, but it's been a while. Uh, with that question, that's a nice segue into my, my pitch here. Um, over the course of the last probably 10 years, as I talked about the budget reductions, um, there was no way I was going to bring forward an expansion of our system um, because we're taxed. Our, our existing people are taxed. Our funds are taxed. Um, but we're 
now that we're into a different mindset of how, how more, much more uh, mission successful can we be by adding more facilities and sites. And so we're actively looking right now to see what we can do to expand if it's strategically appropriate. Is it close to an existing site? Can we service it out of Guernsey State Park, like this Sutton archeological site? You know, can we service it there and have the park rangers and the maintenance personnel go out to Sutton and view it and check on it and do what we need to do? Um, we have the ability to somewhat eat what we kill. So the more visitation we get, the more revenue we bring in, therefore I can pay more maintenance staff, I can pay more park rangers, I can, I can do those things. And more importantly, are we impacting the community in which we're serving in hopes that we bring in those tourism dollars and we truly economically impact an area as well as enriching a life with like uh, the Sutton parcel where we get to potentially protect something for the rest of the time to ensure that it's there for future generations. Other comments, other questions? Okay, thank you, Director and Deputy Director. Appreciate the testimony. Anyone in the room that would like to testify on this? Let's see everybody jumping up. Anyone online that would like to testify? No? Okay. Test public testimony is closed then. And uh, what's your pleasure having here heard the uh, testimony, folks? Move the bill. Move the bill. Okay. Did you get that, Doreen? Senator Ellis made the motion to move the bill. Senator Baldwin seconded. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the bill then. See if there's anything, that, any issues or amendments or anything that you have. Let's start with page one. We like these short and sweet bills are pretty cut and dried. Page two. See any issues at all? Anyone? Okay. This will take a roll call vote then. Roll call vote for Senate file number 59. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Ellis. Aye. Senator Garou is excused. Excused. Senator Jones. Aye. And Chairman Schuler. Aye. Four Thank ayes you. and one excused. Thank you very much. The bill is passed, and I will I will carry that one on the floor. I like the short and sweet one, so we'll give the tough ones to some of the other folks, right? <laughs> All right, moving on. I believe we have time for Senate File 60. Yeah. And uh, so with that, we will uh, get to have our agency folks from Game and Fish. Welcome, Director, and uh, mm -hmm. want to introduce the rest of the folks. We know you. Some of the new ones may not, but. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Brian Nesvik, Director of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And I have with me here today the Chief of our Fiscal Division, Greg Phipps, and then also um, the lady that is all things licensing for Game and Fish that oversees our entire licensing program, Jennifer Doring, here to my right. So we have the opportunity here this morning to present a um, piece of legislation that was recommended by the Wyoming Wildlife Task Force. Madam Chair, you and the Vice Chair are certainly aware of um, the formation of that task force and, and some of the things that they engaged in and uh, some of their recommendations. But for the benefit of Senators uh, Jones and Baldwin, I thought I'd provide a little bit of background on the task force and what they were, what they were charged with since that's the, the origin of this legislation. So the, the task force was formed in about two years ago this month. Um, the governor put together 18 folks um, from both the executive branch, legislative branch, and then stakeholders from all across our state. We had four legislators on the group, um, President Driscoll, Speaker Summers, Representative Flitner, and then also Senator Hicks were the, the four legislators that were on this group. And then there were um, county commissioners, outfitters. There were two cabinet members, myself and uh, Director Scoggin from the Office of State Lands. Um, outfitting industry, sportsmen, landowners. Uh, it was a very diverse group and a very thoughtful group who invested a lot of time over about 18 months and I believe it ended up being about 16 meetings. Um, and tack their charge was really to tackle some of those most complex and contentious issues um, that have 
faced our state related to wildlife policy for, for a number of years. Many of the things that they tackled had come in the form of bills in the past that had never really gone anywhere because of the fact that they, um, I, you know, I just don't think that there had been adequate time because of their complexity to study them enough for legislators to feel comfortable um, voting on them. So, so anyway, they did take on a, a long list of issues. They ended up making a total of about uh, 17 recommendations. Um, some of those were to the legislature, some to the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission, some to the governor, and, and some to other um, federal agencies and other entities as well. This is one of those things that actually came towards the tail end of the task force, this bill, Senate File 60, that we're um, discussing here today. And, and essentially to, to briefly describe what this bill would do, under the current um, law and the current allocation system for non-resident elk, deer, and antelope licenses, there's 40% of those licenses that are um, put in a pool where those folks that would like to um, apply and pay a higher fee um, to apply for the licenses that are available in that pool, which again is 40% of the total, um, they, can, they can pay this higher fee um, and, and it gives folks um, an opportunity to, to apply two different ways. One that costs a little bit more and in theory could provide them a better chance of drawing. In most cases, that ends up being the case that if you apply with the special license fee, you'll have a better chance of drawing. Um, and and the, the cost of that special license fee is really what's contemplated in this bill. This bill is simply an, an increase to those fees that brings, you know, the discussion at the task force was, was essentially um, this brings those license fees um, in, in line with similar opportunity in other Western states, basically brings Wyoming up, up to the market. Um, this does result, if it were to pass in its current form with the current fee structure, um, this results in a $5.7 million revenue increase for the department. Um, the right now the average number of non-resident special licenses that have been issued over the three-year running average through 2022 has been uh, 2600 plus for non-resident special elk 3800 plus for non-resident special deer and about 3200 uh, for non-resident special antelope um, these costs or these fee increases were um, really they were um, derived from work that Senator Hicks had done on previous bills when he had um, contemplated fee increases to offset revenue impacts that came from other legislation. So these fees were that he, he studied this and he provided these recommendations and um, and so that's where the task force was able to um, obtain these the, the specific changes in fees. And with that, I think we have we do. We have one other member of the task force here today, Cy Gilliland. Um, he would certainly be able to um, help answer any questions, and I suspect he may want to speak on this as a member of uh, the public as well here today. With that, Madam Chair, I would certainly stand for any questions that you might have for me or anybody on my team. Questions? Yeah, Senator Ball. Okay. Again, being a new member, I ask silly questions, right? Mm. And the question may well be for the licensed specialist. Given that 40% group, what are their actual increases and odds? In other words, if I apply as a general person from out of state mm -hmm. versus that 40%, how much do my odds increase of drawing? I mean, is it, does it pay out? Is it, is it worthwhile or what are the odds? Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Baldwin, I'm going to ask Jennifer here to provide some specifics, but in, in general terms, it does increase your odds of drawing. Um, but how much? Um, I'll ask Jennifer to help me with. Go ahead, Jennifer. Madam Chairwoman, Senator Baldwin, um, the specifics on any individual hunt area, those odds of increasing your drawing odds applying in the special um, is very limited um, and very specific to each individual hunt area. Um, but oftentimes, as the director mentioned, those odds do increase substantially for drawing in, a, in an applicant who applies as a special, as well as it often in takes less preference points to draw those licenses. So for non-resident elk, deer, and antelope, um, there are preference points that customers can purchase. And 
So it also increases their drawing odds, but they can draw those licenses usually with um, less preference points um, than they could if they applied in the regular draw. So one specific example is General Elk, and that right now in the special draw is taking just over um, three points, and it's, I think, I believe around five preference points if you're in the regular draw, just as an example. Um, but it is very specific to each individual hunt area. Well, Another follow-up dumb question now would be, since we instituted this special, you know, for the uh, increased, for the increased odds, has there been, how, number one, how long have we had that in place? Number two is, how much of an uptick have we seen in people applying for that? Is it is it increasing each year? Is it staying level? Or is it decreasing? What, how is it going? I'll ask Jennifer again. She's the expert on that. Go ahead, Jennifer. Madam Chairwoman, Senator Baldwin, um, I don't know the specific date of when this um, special fees came into play, um, but I can tell you in the last five years um, for these three species, in 2018, we had just over 15,000 applicants um, apply for these special across elk, deer, and antelope. And in 2022, we had 23,500. So every year we've seen a steady uptick in applications in the special um, draw portion of those willing to pay the special fee. Madam Chair and Senator Baldwin, I'm, I'm just going to take a swag at a, I think it's been a, a roughly two decades to maybe two and a half decades since it went into place. And again, I think that somebody who studies this and has been in the industry for three or four decades will be talking to you here in a minute. He probably has some specifics, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gilliland. Other questions or comments, the director? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I know we have uh, Senator Hicks in the room and uh, I know he, he worked uh, tirelessly with the Wildlife Task, Task Force and I think he has some comments that he'd like to make on this. And uh, if Cy would like to come up as well, I believe we could probably catch both of you, since both of you were members of the Wildlife Task Force. Thank you so much. Oh boy. I'm not sure which one wants to lead us off. Senator Hicks, do you want to start? Okay. Yeah, Madam Chairman and, and members of the committee, um, I would stand for any specific questions on that, but I have a proposed amendment to the bill. And, and as you recall, Madam Chairman and, and your previous chairman, uh, Senator Ellis, this was presented to the TRW committee um, I believe back at your last regular meeting in December. Um, the committee discussed it and we did have another wildlife task force meeting after it was the direction of the committee at the time to take this back to the, to the task force. Um, we did meet subsequent to that directive from the committee. Uh, it was brought up before the task force. Uh, there was a, an affirmative recommendation to also raise the non-resident license fees for what has become uh, terminology of the big five, which is moose, sheep, goat, bison, and grizzly bear. Um, this is the same um, amendment. It's just actually put into LSO form that we had discussed at the last time with the last price. My recollection was that the uh, task force, that was on a 14 to one affirmative recommendation from the task force to to bring that to the trw committee for potential consideration of inclusion into the bill for increasing on the non-resident license fees um, madam chairman you can see what they they were um, bighorn sheep were 2318 went to 3000 mountain goat would go to 27.5 moose to 27.5 and grizzly would go to 7500 of the first four, those numbers were derived by kind of a regional average of the of the states that have those species. And what we looked at was this, you know, what's it's kind of a market-based price as to what's the value of a, a bighorn sheep permit in those states that uh, issue non-resident bighorn sheep permit. Uh, these numbers 
and would reflect something close to what the highest number, what, what uh, it did is it took the two highest adjoining states, or not necessarily adjoining, the states that actually say had bighorn sheep right, and it just said that's what the price is. Um, and so that's where those numbers came from, was based on that market analysis of what the top of the market is currently bearing in those other states, Madam Chairman. So uh, bar any other specific comments uh, on the bill, um, I would stand for any comments on the proposed amendment, uh, you know, if and when the committee decides they would want to work that or so with that, Madam Chairman, I would defer to my uh, task force members. I believe we might have some online too. Thanks, Senator Hicks. Um, I'm not sure I can say your last name. Is it Gilliland? Uh, Gilliland. Gilliland. Okay, yes. sir, go ahead. Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the TRW Senate Committee, uh, last time I spoke in front of you, uh, Senator Ellis was our chairwoman, and I gave you a promise at that point in time that we were going to fix these huge issues that had been uh, plagued, plaguing basically relationships between a lot of different sportsmen's groups. I'm really proud of the work that we did. I'm exhausted, but I am really, really proud of the work we did. I can't even tell you the hundreds of hours I spent reading emails, and I, I personally answered every email that was sent to me. And I, I, cannot, I, I can't even demonstrate or even express just how much uh, goodwill and relationship building that took place between the different members of the different uh, factions that we brought uh, to the task force. And it was it was a, an incredible experience and very worthwhile and and I really hope that you take our recommendations to heart and and know that they were vetted at a, at a level that you you couldn't do otherwise, and that you you take these and pass these recommendations. This particular uh, one was passed by a sixteen to one vote, and uh, and one absent. And so and as as Senator Hicks referred to the, the amendment that. Uh, he has in front of you was passed with a 14 to one vote. And then there's a reason why we, we had to stop at that point in time. And there were some issues with, with how much time we had given the public to comment on stuff like that. And some of our legislator friends on the committee uh, asked that we, you know, bring it forth in this format rather than directly from the committee. So, but, you know, we support his numbers and they're good numbers. And to, to speak to this bill, um, it does, uh, Senator Baldwin, I think, that this special draw has been in place uh, over 30 years. And the reason I remember that as I was here, it was the first time I ever testified in front of the legislature, I had more hair and it wasn't gray. It was a <laughs> long time ago. And I was scared to death to be here to bring this bill forward, but I knew it was gonna be really important for the industry. And it has proven to be a lifesaver for the outfitting industry because you do have an opportunity for that, that client out there that is willing to pay more money for Wyoming's product to have an easier chance at drawing that license. And then you also have 60% of the licenses available for that individual who may not be as well healed, who can has an opportunity to draw a license. So I think it's an incredible system. I'm surprised more states across the West haven't instituted it because it's incredibly fair to both factions, both type of hunters that in both, in my opinion, um, it does get, it closes the gap. So over time, when you see, the special license fee gets increased and you'll see a, a period of three or four years where the draw odds are significantly better for that higher price license and then over time that that, that kind of that kind of closes i think um at a two thousand dollar elk license is what is where the special will end up being and the deer and the antelope will both be over twelve hundred dollars for the special license i think we'll have some breathing room for a significant number of years with that um, the the twelve hundred dollar license for antelope, a lot of people are kind of raising their eyebrows at that. But you got to understand, in in the world we live in, uh, Wyoming is the Saudi Arabia of antelope. That we we are the gold mine of antelope. We have that resource more than anybody else in the world, and it was felt by, and I think this is fair to say, many members of the task force that Wyoming had, was really underpricing its product, and this was a way of of bringing this product up to a level that uh, is really reflective of the demand. 
the demand is off the chart for our elk licenses. We issue 7,250 elk licenses a year with 32,000 people applying for those. So that tells you there's an incredible demand for our product and, and we needed to do something with the pricing structure. But in the long term, it's really going to be a help for the game and fish too, because they do have, we do have significantly declining numbers in the state of, of deer, particularly mule deer. And, and as time goes on, their ability to uh, remain out of the general fund and, and be a well-functioning uh, funded organization is going to rely on more on antelope and more on elk. And that's just the reality of the situation. And I think, and Jennifer can correct me if I'm wrong, but like in the over the last four year period of time, Wyoming's selling about 18,000 fewer antelope licenses statewide than what we sold four years ago. So we do have a great product, but at the same time, you know, you do have to look to the future and, and keep your funding levels up there. And I think this is a great way to do it. So as a task force member, I, I would ask that you pass this bill and support it, but also wearing my other hat as the president of the Wyoming Outfitter and Guides Association, we are in full support of this bill too, and ask that you uh, support it and pass this bill. Questions? No, Madam Chair, but privilege. I just want to thank you. Um, when I first got on TRW, there were a lot of lingering um, disputes out there about these really contentious issues. And I know that we've received some of those emails and it was always nice to tell those constituents, there's a task force working on this. Um, that group brought together, you know, people who don't always see eye to eye on everything. And I just appreciate your willingness to spend all that time to work together to come up with some solutions for us. And, um, you know, I know you'll never get those hours back, but I just want you to know how much we appreciate it. It does not go unnoticed. And I, I'm often cynical of task forces, you know, you never know what kind of product they're gonna produce. But um, this has been, in my view, a really worthwhile effort. And, you know, certainly with Senator Hicks being involved and other members of the legislature, I just I can't even thank you enough for all the time that you spent and really considering what's right for Wyoming. Um, so, you know, certainly your support um, makes this it, it's really important to me. And I just like I said, can't thank you enough. And you too, Senator Hicks. Other comments or questions? No, I, I would just like to reiterate that as well, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were getting bombarded by <clears throat> quite a few emails before the task force uh, was uh, put together, and it's it's really helped. In fact, that was one of the questions I was going to ask. Even though uh, these, I think, prices keep us more in line with what the market value is around the, around the states around us that have these animals. Um, I've only received, I think, two emails from out of state uh, folks. So even though we have fewer licenses, are you guys getting much pushback? Either one of you from out of state hunters. Madam Chair, uh, Senators, uh, that's a really good question because we have started amongst ourselves when we when we talk to these out-of-state clients, out asking them their thoughts on this these prices. And, you know, it's really interesting, and, and you hear a common theme from these non-resident hunters. They're like, you know, you have such a great resource out in Wyoming, it's such a beautiful place. I'm just grateful that I have the opportunity to come experience what you your resources once in a while. They're incredibly grateful. To have the opportunity to come and hunt our state, and I and I do I, I really appreciate your words, uh, senators. I uh, it was it was a grind. It was worth it. And Larry and I drink beer together now. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, I need to make a clarification. Only when he's buying. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> Any other comments? The Wildlife Task Force. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, for everything that you guys have done. It's been it's been an amazing group, and it's really taken a load off of of my email list. Thank you so much, yeah, and I think you. this is a good move. So I appreciate right. it. Do we have any? Uh, I think we have some testimony from uh, Zoom, don't we, on this bill? Seems like there were a couple of folks that were signed up to testify. Okay, anyone in the room? Okay, let's go ahead with anyone in the room first. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Jess Johnson. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. And I wanted to come up here and just reiterate what both of these gentlemen that were up here said before and say that as someone that was in the room and in the audience for most of those meetings, it was incredible, the controversy and the controversial topics that they were charged with to tackle. Um, and, and what they came to as compromise. And, you know, certainly, you know, 
we'll always hear the dissidents. There's always going to be folks that aren't on board, but but the work and the hours put in on that to find those compromises was incredibly impressive. And, you know, as far as Wyoming Wildlife Federations and the stance on this, we tend to go neutral on tag bills because it splits hunters down the middle and there's uh, opinions flying everywhere. But this one was a really easy one to get behind because it is it's it's funding for game and fish. It's helping with this sort of special license and, and actually giving it a bump. So so what you're paying for is more opportunity or a, a uh, easier way to draw that. But it's also not taking away from the folks that are can't afford that and talking about the folks that, you know, um, don't, can't afford an outfitter and do come and do the deep. Uh, DIY hunts here and, and that having that split I think is important and where we were glad to see um, it, it made as a market difference and I just I think that what came out of this task force was relationships that were built in very unlikely places I think that as we see more and more controversial topics come down the line um, we can take a page out of their book and go back to the table and try and 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 work on those relationships that were built and and i know as wyoming wildlife federation we're here for that we can pledge that we'll be at that table and and try and work that out whatever controversial topics hit um so yeah i wanted to introduce myself you'll see me often in this uh in this committee and um yeah i'll stand for any questions thank you questions for jess wildlife well, thank you very much for your testimony you. appreciate it Anyone else in the room that would like to testify on this bill? All right, I guess we'll go to Zoom if we have anybody. I know we had, a, like I said, a couple signed up. Are they still on, online available? Madam Chairman, we do have a few people on Zoom watching. I would just ask um, if either of you gentlemen would like to testify, please use the raise hand function. This modern technology is tough sometimes for us old timers. Okay, go ahead and introduce yourself. Maybe. Okay. Looks like Mike, Mike okay. going. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. My name is Mike Schmidt and I live in Southwest Wyoming. And I was fortunate enough to attend a few of the uh, TRW, or the uh, Wyoming Wildlife Task Force meetings. Um, and uh, again, I'll reiterate what everybody else has said. It was a monumental task for those folks, a very noble exercise and they had a lot of uh, hot button issues presented to them. So um, my thanks as a, as a long, long time Wyoming resident and uh, hunter and angler, I thank them very much for all the effort they put into that, that task force. Um, my concern is uh, for this bill, I know some of the task force meetings that I attended, there was a, a one-time proposal to do an outfitter only drawing. Um, set aside, thing aside and the proposal was to set aside 40 and there was some talk of up to 50% of the available non-resident tags for an outfitter only draw. Uh, the TRW committee um, elected not to advance that for various reasons. Um, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the uh, task force uh, uh, session here recently is when this bill or this idea came forward to to just raise the the uh, non-resident fees for the special license allocation. My concern is is that it it's really essentially an outfitter only uh, proposal because some of the license fees are going to be raised by upwards of 200%. Um, I'm just not sure why it's needed. Um, we have, uh, as far as the outfitters are concerned, there's, there's roughly 40,000 non-resident licenses available to the outfitting industry, which by the way, is a very important industry for Wyoming. Um, I just got some rough numbers here. There's, uh, just for non-resident elk hunters, there's roughly between the 7,250 licenses that uh, Sasha mentioned, plus an additional 5,000 cow-calf tags, there's 12,250 non-resident elk tags available. Of those 1,250 non-resident licenses, the 
figures per their own website only booked 3,496 of those, those folks. Same thing with deer. Uh, Wyoming, uh, Wyoming Game and Fish issued roughly 70,000 deer licenses in, in uh, 2014 or 2022, I'm sorry. 20% uh, of those are issued to non-residents. So roughly 14,000 licenses for non-residents in uh, Hunt, Wyoming. Outfitters, again, per their own website, only booked 2,742 deer hunters. Pronghorn Animal, Wyoming Game and Fish issued uh, roughly 60,000 uh, pronghorn licenses. 20, again, go to the, to the non residents Wyoming Outfitters and Guides only booked 2,828 of those pronghorn antelope hunters. So again, my question is, why is this needed? The bill, um, I'm just worried that the bill is gonna take a lot of the working class men and women across this country out of the run. Some of them are doing it now, but some of them, if we raise these up to 200%, like I say, for those pronghorn tags, it's gonna take a lot of the working class men and women in the country that dream of having a Wyoming experience out of the running. Those, a lot of those hunters are do-it-yourself hunters, just like uh, the young lady proposed. They, and those, those are important to the economy of the state. They're the ones that are buying motel rooms, purchasing gas, eating in restaurants, spending money in grocery stores as they're here on their lifelong plan to hunt Wyoming. Granted, outfitters provide a valuable service. They do buy a lot of groceries for their clients, but most of their clients are in the upper class. They fly in, they hunt, they fly out. They don't get, we don't get near the impact uh, as we do with a with a do-it-yourself hunter. A uh, concern of mine is I have a large family and they're spread out across the country. If these licenses continue to climb right now, it's going to prop them out of being able to hunt in Wyoming. They're working class people. They're blue collar workers. It's going to price them out. I may never have the chance to hunt with my family or friends again from out of state, let alone my, I have 10 grandkids. Five grandsons, five granddaughters. I don't know where their life is going to take them. If, they, if their lives take them out of the state of Wyoming, I may never have the opportunity to hunt with them because they cannot draw a license. I'm not saying this idea should be should be uh, uh, not used at all. I just don't think it's the right time. Right now, let's. It's it's almost. It's something that I think is wanted more than needed at the moment. Well, the Game Fish Department has a budget that they've been meeting. I don't know that they need. Yeah, the extra money is always nice. It's always nice to do things when you, when you have that extra cash, but they are funded and they fund them through licenses. So I would just like to say in the end here that to, to close and wrap up my, my uh, thoughts here is that please let's wait on this. This is something that we can table for now. It's, it's not a bad idea. It's just not a, a, an idea that is needed at the moment. And maybe, maybe in closing, I, I always hear that Wyoming is always behind everybody else, but you know, maybe I'm a little bit of a prideful person. I, I always hate it when I hear that we should do something because everybody else is. Wyoming is a very unique state, very independent. We have what we need here. Let's continue to do what with what we have and save this opportunity for down the road when it is really needed. Let's keep our independence. Let's keep this idea on the table and let's use it when we need it, not when it's wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Do you have uh, comments or questions, anyone, for Mr. Schmidt? Thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have one more, I think. Madam Chairman, we have Rusty Bell on Zoom. Welcome, Rusty. Thank you for, for showing up today, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time. Rusty Bell. Um, I was one of the co-chairs for the Wyoming Wildlife Task Force. I apologize for, for being on late today. Um, 
And uh, I was I was actually in another advisory board meeting in Gillette. So I, I apologize for not being here. And I didn't get to, to hear uh, the bill introduction. And I don't know if Senator Hicks did that or not. But um, just one of the things about the uh, the uh, the task force, and we did talk about this a lot um, in the last couple meetings, this really this decision to, to bring this forward was was just a supply and demand issue. Um, this is something that uh, is uh, in Wyoming, we have this this wonderful uh, supply of certain animals, and uh, we have uh, with some of those animals, it's actually uh, going down. But we certainly have this increase in demand um, that that just doesn't seem to, no matter what happens, seem to go down. That demand continues to grow and grow and grow. And bringing this up to speed um, and to, or, or at least up to par with with some of our Western states, was a big deal. And, and a lot of uh, what we had a lot of conversation about. Um, and and um, and so. You know, I wish I could tell you that we had a lot of specific uh, uh, feedback or um, uh, community uh, or public comment on this particular um, issue. We did have thousands and thousands of, of uh, public comments on uh, the non-resident uh, license fee allocations and, and other things that we talked about. Um, um, Madam Chair, we actually had uh, 16 meetings in 18 months, so it was um, it was kind of like a legislative committee on steroids. Um, we really, a lot of those were day and a half or two day meetings. And so we did uh, run a lot of these things to ground, but ultimately on this, it really wasn't, it wasn't something that, that game and fish uh, department asked for. Um, our task force was, was, uh, uh, had said early on that if we if we made recommendations that brought a, a fiscal decline to them that we would make up for that um, through other actions. Uh, they did not ask for this this part of it. It was brought up by the task force and discussed by the task force simply and mostly because of a supply and demand issue. Um, uh, certainly, I would stand for any questions on on that. Uh, and and if you have some questions on um, some of the things that we know that need to be funded or that could use their funding, certainly the director is probably a better person to ask about that. Um, but uh, uh, you know, we have some species, including mule deer, bighorn sheep, and and uh, moose that could use uh, habitat dollars to habitat and things like that for the department. So uh, I, I don't know that I'm the best one to to speak on that, but certainly I would stand for any questions on what the task force's comments and and work on this uh, subject was. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions from Mr. Bell? Comments? I guess the only one I have. Uh, Mr. Bell, is, uh, I, and I asked this question a little bit earlier, uh, were most of the recommendations that came from the Wildlife Task, task Force for fairly much, much a, a slam dunk? I mean, 15 to 1, 16 to 1, 14 to 1. Uh, was yeah, it uh, controversy or, or just great. Uh, Madam Chair, that's a great question. Um, we have a whole uh, list of things that, that went to, to either uh, either your, your body or um, the department and I think this this uh, vote on this was either 16 to two or 17 to one, and I apologize for not having those those uh, in in front of me right now. But most of our uh, most of our issues, um, we didn't have uh, a large amount of of dissension, and so most of the issues that we passed, although our although our uh, our task force. Um, adopted rules that that if it was a majority, we would move it forward. Um, I think maybe the closest uh, thing that we had uh, to uh, to even would have been um, fourteen to four or thirteen to five on one of those issues, but this one wasn't wasn't one of those. Thank you. Uh, any other? Uh, I think I appreciate the testimony. Thank you so much. It's, it's good to hear from the Wildlife Task Force. I was able to to listen to a couple of them after the fact, and I, I thought they, they went really, really well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Emily, anybody else online? Okay. With that, I think we'll co close uh, public testimony. And uh, what's your pleasure, committee? Move the bill. Move the bill. It's been moved by Senator Ellis, second by, he beat you, by Senator Baldwin. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the bill. Um, we do have the amendment here. Uh, if you want to work it with uh, as a standing committee amendment, we can do it that way or move the amendment. Move the amendment. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I would move the amendment as well. It's um, 1101, Standing Committee Amendment. And it starts on page one, line two. And it's pretty simple. Uh, after deer, insert bighorn sheep. I guess you can just read through those. And page uh, one, line four also. This looks like some changes there. We're just adding in the, the big five there, the rest of the big five. Uh, page one, line nine. Okay. Any questions on those? Okay. All right, let's take a look at page three. Unless you have any questions on page one. Okay, let's go to page two first. Doesn't look like there's anything from the amendment on that. So any questions on page two? Okay, page three. And now we have uh, after, let's see, page three, after line 14, where is, is this is where we insert uh, the new fees. Uh, so take a look at those and see if you're comfortable with those. Any questions on those? All right. And then we've got uh, 23.2.107 at the bottom of that amendment. Uh, I'm going to switch on over. That is uh, basically the non-resident uh, applicant will pay a license fee of $6,000. That's for the bison, the wild bison. That was the last one of that. Okay. Questions on that? Comments? Okay. We had a motion on the amendment. I think we did. We did? All right. Question. Uh, yeah, question. There's a question on it. Let's go ahead and uh, take a roll call vote on that. Just a oh, can we do just a motion? Oh, okay. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the, the amendment's passed. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take a roll call vote on the bill, unless you have comments. Anything else to add? Okay, roll call vote on the, on the bill. Senate file 60 as amended, Senator Baldwin. Senator Ellis. Aye. Senator Garou. Excused. Senator Jones. Aye. And Chairman Schuler. Aye. Okay, the bill is passed. I'll let you go ahead, Doreen, and give the official vote. <laughs> Four eyes, one excuse. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to, yes, comment? Maybe he wants to carry it. Is Excuse me? Can ask him if he wants to carry it. Yes. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you, but Senator Hicks, would you carry this on the floor? I mean, I guess I need to call you majority floor leader. Sorry about that. Would you be interested in here? Okay. Thank you very much. I'd appreciate that. All right. With that, uh, unless there's any other business anyone has, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Yes.